Anyway, welcome to Philosophy Roulette, number 245, where I read and review philosophy papers for the live audience on Twitch, and later for people on YouTube. Um, basically I just read stuff, comment on it, and get comments from the uh, chat, and we figure out if anyone has anything inter interesting to say. Side comment, uh, I am rather, I've been rather sick the last few days, so um, if I like can't stay sitting, something by Terence Cuneo, sure, and I take requests, so if I fall over, that's why. Kune, not Kunep, Cuneo. So I've got a Terence Cuneo. Let's just see what we got going on here. I mean, is this guy on your like want to hit list, or is this like somebody you like? Um, all right. So we got University of Vermont. Gen the snail. Oi, hello, welcome. Thank you for being here. Yes, we've got Cinesemiotics. Awesome. Cryonics forever. Gen the snail. Thank you. All right, so what do we got? What do we got? Ritualized faith essays. Well, this is just a book. Published articles. They have it here. Let's see what this one is. Forthcoming. It's a... Let's just open it. LibreOffice paper. Thirty-one pages, double spaced, good enough for me. Okay, cool. This is defending the moral epistemic parody with Terence Cuneo. Sounds like a fun like thing. We can uh, I mean, <laughs> you're gonna make a suggestion in a bit. Oh, I'm sorry, Cinesemiotics. All right, but yeah, Cryonics uh sniped your spot. Okay, yeah, I've been like downing these quart size, which is 32 ounce, uh, that's 946 milliliter, like, bottles of, like, water and, like, uh, sugar-free Gatorade. If I get through this, this will be my third quart of, uh, one of these today. Yay for dehydration. Okay, good. You'll like this too. Good, good, good. All right, so let's give the link. What did I just do? Okay. Pro streamer. Yeah, so there's the link if you guys want it. Um, Cryonics, uh, do I got your seal of approval, I guess? Um... Yeah, and if you come late, always type exclamation point paper and uh, the link shows back up. So, oh, send a semi had vodka. Um, I'll tell you a short story about that once when someone asked me about does like liquor make me smarter? And the answer is no, of course. But um, thank you, Cryonics. Um, but I had a friend in college and uh, he said, you know, everyone else gets like crazier and stupider the more they drink. They're like, with you, you get more reasonable and like more careful and like seem to be like more like deliberate the more you get drunk. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that seems like the smart thing to do. Like, I know I'm drunk, so I like be more careful. I don't want to be like super stupid. And he's like, wait, wait, this doesn't make any sense. He so the more drunk you get is a uh, shadow for the pun parody parody. That is good. He, he does get a plus one for that. Um, and so he's like, wait. So he's like, wait, wait, wait. So you seem to get more reasonable though when you're drunk, and like you're smarter when you're drunk, and like it, like you seem like better, like. It's like you're, you're like you're thinking better when you're drunk. I'm like, mm, well, if you say so. He's like, this doesn't make any sense. How is it that everyone else gets stupider and you get smarter? And I was like, and like he just like ran off like frustrated. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, don't believe the hype, kids. You're never smarter when you're drunk. 
You may be more other things, but you're not smarter. <laughs> okay. I was wondering, do you guys think I should update the title of my stream to be like, put the title of the uh, paper in it? Like, we could, like, do that. Let me try that real fast. Huh. Maybe this worked. I don't know. I don't really care, but it might be interesting to see if, uh, for discoverability. Anyway, so this is what we're going to doing, be doing for a little bit. Feel free to ask questions along the way. As always, I don't know what this is, but we're going to try and figure it out. So give me a, a question. Uh, send me all your questions as you want, and uh, we'll see if it makes sense. Cool. <coughs> so, and yeah, let me know what you think. All right, so introduction. And yeah, so this is, it says 31 pages, looks like double spaced, pretty reasonable. In the normative web, 2007, Terence Cuneo gave voice to the intuitive idea that meta-ethics and meta-epistemology form a seamless normative web, arguing that moral and epistemic realism stand or fall together. The backbone of Cuneo's case is what he calls... <laughs> That's right, synesemiotics, that's right. It's it's for being polite. It's not for actually getting answers. You're going to notice a lot this a lot about streamers. They do a lot of things, and you can see they already knew what they're doing because there's a delay between what you do and what chat. Uh, like, there's a 10-second delay or something. So it's just, like, the state of the world because there's a, a delay between the stream and the uh, what, chat response because you're not going to hear what I said for a few seconds anyway. So I already know what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's kind of an act, you know? It's kind of like Twitch. It's the whole thing is a bit of an act. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, uh, let's find out what this normative web is. The backbone of Cuneo's case is what he calls the core argument. P1. If moral facts do not irreducibly exist, then epistemic facts do not irreducibly exist. P2. Epistemic facts irreducibly exist. C1. So moral facts irreducibly exist. P3. If moral facts irreducibly exist, then moral realism is true. C2. So moral realism is true. What? I'm sorry. I mean... Uh, I mean, they're modus tollens in this thing, but, I mean, these things aren't the sort of, like, modus tollens, like, works, of course, in logic, but that doesn't mean it works in, like, all practice. Um, so, I mean, this is just very, I find this very suspect already. It, even if you assume that epistemic facts irreducibly exist, then, like, it, the fact that epistemic facts exist, does that imply that moral facts exist? Um, I find that, like a bit of a stretch because I just don't see why moral facts would depend on epistemic facts existing. Anyway, so that's just one point of a, let me actually, shoot, yeah, I haven't done this in a while, my apologies, I haven't used uh, this, okay, so here's what we're doing, yeah, so this was what it was like the fact that you're going to say like a moral fact, like if an epic, cause like this, it makes it sound a little better to do it in the modus tollens with, if these things do not exist, then this one does not exist. But then you say, well, this one does exist. So therefore this one does, it sounds better this way. But if I said, if epistemic facts exist, then they, then moral facts exist. But why would I accept that hypothetical to begin with? I don't understand that hypothetical. Like, I just reject that, and I'll be like, eh, I reject P1. I mean, this version here doesn't sound as bad, but the the flipped version, the uh, contrapositive, like when you just put epistemic facts first and you take out the neg negation, it does sound bad. Anyway, 
In a critical appraisal of Cuneo's book, Chris Heathwood argues that we ought to reject the argument's first premise, aha, the so-called parody premise. Heathwood's objection hinges on two claims. The first is, a true sentence reports a descriptive fact, if and only if its semantic context is analyzable solely in descriptive, that is, non-normative terms. Okay. And the second is, the semantic content of epistemic sentences is analyzable solely descriptive, in solely descriptive terms, but semantic content of moral senses, sentences is not. All right, so hopefully they're going to break this down, so let's keep going. From these claims, Heathwood concludes that true epistemic sentences, sentences report descriptive facts, while true moral sentences do not. Okay, so they're saying that we've got like mixed kind here in this sense, so they can't possibly, uh, it, the sentence doesn't actually work. From which it trivially follows, epistemic facts are descriptive while moral facts are not. So we're not talking about the same things is what they're saying right there. Um, that's different from what I was saying above. What I was saying is, above is I don't understand what epistemic facts and moral facts have to do with each other. I just don't even know. Like, they're saying they're of different kinds. I'm like, I don't care if they're different kinds. I don't even know what they have to do with each other, one kind or not. They could be the same kind of thing, but like... Just because one exists doesn't mean the other exists. Like, just because one apple exists doesn't mean another apple exists. Hmm. Okay. Given the further assumption that a moral or an epistemic factor reducibly exists in case it is not descriptive, we can conclude, says Heathwood, that the parody premise is false. Um. So if it's not descriptive, it's like you're saying something about the world in sense of, like, how the world should be. That means it's not descriptive, it's normative then we can just say the whole thing is false because you're not talking about the, the right stuff in the right way. Okay, whatever. Call the claim that the epistemic facts are descriptive while moral facts are not the disparity thesis. Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis is striking in several respects. I actually agree with like the authors here. I agree with, I think Heathwood's right, but I don't, I don't think he argued for it well. I mean, if, uh, assuming that the authors are being fair to Heathwood here. For one thing, his case is not driven by the conviction that the normative domain, as such, can be reducibly analyzed. To the contrary, Heathwood identifies himself as sympathetic with the non-reductive moral realist view that Kinev defends, indeed with a non-naturalist version of moral realism. What is more, Heathwood supports the second premise of his argument by appealing to a version of the open question argument, employing one pro prominent argument often used in favor of non-reductive realism to block another argument for it. In doing so, Heathwood presents non-reductive realism with what appears to be a difficult choice. Either give up one of, of the core argument or the open question argument, the choice looks difficult because no matter which option they choose, non-reductive realists will have one less argument for their view than they would like. Sent cryonics forever. But are moral facts supposed to be normative themselves? Isn't that what normative theories are for? See, this is a question. Yes and no, cryonics. Um, sometimes they're supposed to describe things the way the world is, and sometimes they're supposed to tell you the way the world should be. So you've got the descriptive theories, and then you've got like the sort of meta-ethic theories telling you the way, uh, what what it means to be like good. And like what does it mean to be good is not the same thing as what should you do uh, to be good. But like um, you can do both. Um, but, more, but are moral facts supposed to be normative themselves? And, and you know what? I don't know actually what the facts themselves are meant to do. You know, I'd have to, like, in the right hands, maybe they can do both or they only do one or the other. But, you know, ethics is not my, like, area of, uh, well, nothing's my area of expertise. I'm not that much of an expert. But, um, ethics is, like, my, one of my least, uh, in depth, uh, least depth areas. And so, my understanding of exactly what the ethicists are doing with these things are is very sketchy. Um, but they can do both. I know that much. So they can do both. Okay. So whatever. Let's see. They're going to get... Okay, so we're getting a little bit what they're going to talk about in this paper here. So that's good. In this paper, we contend that non-reductive realists do not face this difficult choice or to state our central contention more accurately, we argue that non-reductive realists do not face this difficult choice for the reasons that Heathwood offers, since they ought not reject the parody premise on the basis of anything like Heathwood's argument for the disparity thesis. 
central to our case is the claim that while analyzing epistemic com concepts in terms of descriptive ones has, attract has its attractions, it is considerably more challenging than Heathwood maintains. You know what? I like these authors. Um, this writing is clear, and I can tell you why. Because I knew immediately from the setup that this is exactly where they were going. The setup Heathwood used and the, their presentation of Heathwood's argument made it. I knew this is like this is what they were gonna do because I told you I said I agree. I said this is not the way to argue for this sort of thing, and that's exactly where they were going. But. The fact that they set me up to do that, because I ain't, like, these people are smart. I've said this before. Anytime you think you're, like, being clever in a philosophy paper, chances are it's because they want you to be thinking that. They want you to be, like, that. they got you to think that. And they want you to think that, and that's what they were doing. And so it's like, well, I was thinking this, and that's exactly where they were going. And that's, and then I, that, that's where they were going, because that's what I thought, because that's what they wanted. And so this is like well set up. Okay. Our focus then will be on the one attempt to defend the claim that epistemic concepts and facts are descriptive. But we have larger ambitions when responding to the core argument. An increasing number of philosophers have argued that we should hold that epistemic concepts or facts are descriptive. Since these positions are often not worked out in detail, one possibility is that their advocates would endeavor to develop their descriptivist positions along the lines that Heathwood suggests. If the argument we pr press against Heathwood's position is correct, however, then following Heathwood's lead is not a promising option. Epistemic descriptivism epistemic descriptivist views will have to be developed along different lines at the end of our discussion we touch again on this matter yeah i actually don't know if i agree with anything the authors actually hold but i think everything they're going to argue for is going to be right in this paper just like from this setup this looks like they know what they're doing <laughs> <laughs> and I want to just like tell you why I, I'm saying this because in terms of the writing, the they've set this up, and you can tell by their the quality of the distinctions here. The parody and disparity. I mean, already they've got the core argument. It was lined up. This everything's this premise one. This is everything else. These other stuff like this is just like window dressing. It this this is the line. I got hung up on it immediately. It was the important line. They immediately said that. Um, then they, you know, they're talking about this weird descriptive thing, which is just really weird. And then they go and be like, no, that's really weird. And <laughs> it's like, it, it's just like they set, they, it's a big old setup. And they've done it so well and everything's just coming down. But the nice part about this is that they starting from a moral argument and then they're gonna and, and then they're generalizing to the epistemic too. Because if the two things are in any way similar, then the problems that they're accusing the people who are attacking them have are also gonna like plague other people that are similar to them. So that's a, this is a competent, this is what I would go with, like, this is a well set up paper at the moment. Two, the case for the disparity thesis. Yes, and please ask questions. I mean, I, I just, uh, it's not unusual you get a, uh, it's maybe just because I'm sick. I'm like, hey, this is good. Partners in crime. <laughs> but yeah, what's going on? Uh, semiotics. Okay, you sent me some. No, right, I'll take a look in a bit. Let's begin by laying out Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis in more detail, beginning with the nor the no eh, beginning with the notion of a descriptive fact. A descriptive fact, Heathwood tells us, is a fact that is expressed in solely descriptive terms. Examples of such facts would include that Germany invaded Poland, that Obama is presently making a difficult decision, and that people prefer happiness to misery. You're suggesting which you whisper link? Okay, yeah. I mean, I see the link. I haven't, like, clicked on it, but after this, if I can, like, still set up. Examples of such facts. Yeah, so we got facts. Moral descriptivism is the thesis that moral facts, roughly those facts reported by true sentences containing predicates such as good, just, and right, are identical with descriptive facts. Um, so let's see. 
Um, so, like, that would say, like, you know, being nice to people is good is the same thing as, like, Germany invaded Poland. It's the same kind of fact. Epistemic descriptivism, in contrast, is the thesis that epistemic facts, roughly those facts reported by true sentences containing predicates such as justified, reasonable, and warranted, are identical with descriptive facts. So I say, like, um, it is warranted to believe, or it is justified to n believe that something, because that would be epistemic, to know that. Um, the same thing, like, it is warranted... Or, like, to believe or know it is warranted that Germany invaded Poland. Okay. So they're all the same, then. The disparity thesis implies that we ought to take up different attitudes towards these two views, rejecting moral descriptivism but accepting epistemic descriptivism. Okay. On the face of things, this is a surprising proposal, since the types of arguments offered for moral descriptivism... Cinesemiotics, did you just cheer 100 bits? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. On the face of things, this is a surprising proposal, since the types of arguments offered for moral descriptivism by philosophers such as Frank Jackson and Mark Schroeder would seem to generalize to epistemic facts. Jackson's proposal, you will recall, goes to the claim that facts, who, facts which are metaphysically equivalent are identical. Since moral facts are metaphysically equivalent with descriptive facts on which they supervene, so Jackson claims they are identical with descriptive facts. But if this is right, the same will be true of epistemic facts. They too will be metaphysically equivalent to the descriptive facts on which they supervene, and thus identical with them. Sort of a back, sort of a bribe. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess I might be bribable. I haven't even thought about it. No one's uh, paid me to uh, referee before or, like, read papers. I mean, although, granted, I think people have been nice to me in order to get uh, feedback on stuff. So maybe it's this is not true. I kind of, maybe they have been kind of bribing me. Uh, I mean, not Twitch. I mean, in, like, outside, in, like, real life. <sighs> okay. As already indicated, Heathwood wishes to distinguish his approach from those such as Jackson's by making two main moves. The first is to assume it's an unspoken understanding. Yeah. Yeah, like, the rest of the world, don't look at Twitch uh, chat. Like, just don't do it. Tropical geek. Isn't that what politics is? Verbal bribery. Uh, yeah, basically. It's all quid pro quo. Quid pro quo. Um, you know, maybe when politics is done right, tropical geek. <laughs> Not always. And low. You know, am I, can I move this up a little? There we go. That's better. Yeah, so, a true sentence report, yeah, so, the question is, okay, so I just want to, like, let me recap what happened right here real, real, real fast. The, basically, the, these people are trying to all argue that their kind of facts are all real facts. Like, our facts are good facts. Which is fine. I mean, they probably are. Um... And so then they're saying, well, in that case, you get too many things, and you're going to get all these moral things, or you get these epistemic things that you might not have thought you had. And some people are okay with that, and they're going to try and say, well, look, you don't want to get the moral ones in here. The moral ones are bad kinds of facts, and so even though you want to keep all the good facts over here, you want to get, get the bad moral facts. Those aren't real facts. And so that's what's going on. But like they're trying to define what counts as like a real fact. Tropical Geek says, social politics is verbal bribery to me, bribery to me, juggling of English to say something that says nothing and promises zero. Yeah, mostly. Um, of course, sometimes things happen, or sometimes worse things happen usually, and so it's not completely um, without merit what's going on. So, I mean, yes, it, it's you say nothing and you promise zero, but like, there's definitely worse outcomes, so... 
Um, you you might be always choosing the lesser of two evils, but it's a, uh, I guess you're picking the, it. So, but the promises are not zero. Like sometimes they're worth something. So, I don't know what, but like they're worth something. You have to. You have to believe the really shitty politicians when they say they're really shitty. Because, like, then they can be really, really shitty. Yeah, and that's why... Well, there you go, Cinesemiotics. Alright, continuing. A true sentence reports a descriptive fact if and only if its semantic content is analyzable solely in descriptive terms. Okay. For ease of reference, we'll refer to this assumption as the assumption of analysis. Uh, and calmly examine the... Yeah. yeah, well, we try to be calm. It doesn't always work. I don't even always assume that calmness is the best thing. Most of the time, but not always. Sometimes you should be angry. For ease of reference, we'll refer to this assumption as the assumption of analysis. Heathwood is well aware, of course, that many philosophers would reject this assumption, and in his essay, he offers no defense of it. While we believe the assumption of analysis is questionable, we will not dispute, dispute it in our, discuss, in our discussion, uh, I can't speak, noting only that if one were to reject it, Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis would have little appeal. Yeah, see, that's the thing. You might not believe this. Um that it's a kind of one particular kind of fact, if and only if its semantic content is analyzable solely in descriptive terms. But why why is the anal analysis depending on what kind of fact it is? I mean, that's a little bit weird. Uh, once it's not calm, you're not doing philosophy. Um, I think there's some things that are maybe calm aligned that are not exactly calm like you can get like you know uh you can be in like sort of yeah calm aligned i I, I wouldn't say calm like calm it might not be i think that might just be the way we're using it might be slightly different like you could there might not be only one way to do philosophy so emotions uncontained or obstacles to philosophical thought most of the time, cinesemiotics, sometimes you need, like, a little bit of, like, emotion to, like, you know, get yourself going. And, uh, like, sometimes you need, like, uh, that extra push to get through. Just because you don't... Most thought happens when you're calm. That doesn't mean you can't get other work done at other times, too. Your tropical emotional temperament is not well received in this country. Hmm. Well, you're on Twitch, so you are in the internet the world wide web yeah there we go there we go cinesemiacs yeah i think we're just you know like cross talking cuz it's hard to explain everything yeah the usa definitely has problems with certain um yeah the, the, certain attitudes i don't think they like i mean it, it has to do with cultural facts um like historical cultural issues here that it's like looked down upon or certain in certain things which is you know historically a mess of course <laughs> yeah we are all, we are all kind of angry at this point so but yeah that's fair but that's like a cultural sort of thing and uh It'd be better if we could somehow get over that, but that's going to be a while. I mean, there's always the uh, thing, like my cousin, his girlfriend, she's from originally from another country. Family's all from like, or, I mean, she was young when she came here. But, like, when they're talking, it always sounds like they're in a fight. And they're not in a fight, but it sounds like they're in a fight. So, it's like, they're like, oh, my God, what's wrong? And they're like, nothing's wrong. Oh. <laughs> Emotion should not lessen the weight of truth. Yeah, but it does get, in, it, it can get in the way of thought. It was, uh, I think, Cinesemiotic's point. Not that it lessens the weight of truth. It's that you're not always thinking straight when you got your, uh, When when you gotta when you see red, you're not always think you're not seeing right, you're not thinking straight. Alright. Let's go. Okay, continuing. So let's where were we? 
The second move that Heathwood makes is to build a case for the premise that the semantic content of true epistemic sentences is analyzable in solely descriptive terms, but the semantic content of true moral sen sentences is not. Like, okay. Whatever, Heathwood. Heathwood's case for this premise is one that turns on a version of the open question argument. Send us semiotics. Thank you again for the another 50 bits. According to Heathwood's favored version of the open question argument, we begin with a pair of terms. I have decoded for you some huge insight. Huge. Well, that is fantastic. I'm happy to have been part of it. The first member of the pair is the paradigmatic moral term being good. Oh yeah, and if you ever write a paper on this, I want a footnote. <coughs> Thank you to Nogur. Nogur zero on Twitch. <laughs> the first member of the pair is the paradigmatic moral term being good. In Heath in Heathwood's view, there's no realistic prospect of analyzing the meaning of sentences that employ this term by appeal to only descriptive concepts such as something we desire. We can see this, Heathwood says, by employing the following test. Sounds Trumpian? Oh, I'm going Trumpian again, I'm sorry. I, I, I go fascist very quick. The moral OQA. What the heck is this? The sentence, this is something we desire, but it's not good, is not self-contradictory. M2. If M1, then good does not mean the same thing as something we desire. M3. Therefore, good does not mean the same thing as something we desire. Another a shave and haircut. I was going to semiotics, except I got sick. Topical Geek says that is it. The assumption that we... That what is said during emotion is born in the heat of it is what takes it out of its certainty, certainty of trustworthy. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I'm hairy today. Like, I, I it's actually getting annoying. <sighs> <laughs> All right. Heathwood generalizes from this case to the conclusion that it is reasonable to believe that no analysis of the moral in terms of the descriptive will be plausible. I mean... I don't know anyone, well, look, I feel like they're kind of beaten up on this poor guy, but like, it sounds like he did it to himself. I, I like this sentence, like if you, you think you're going to prove something by saying this is something we desire, but it's not good. And then like, you're proving something about the words good and desire from like this one sentence. Like, these are big words, and the fact that, like, you can make a sentence where they don't quite make sense, like, it's not exactly what you might think it is, is, like, that doesn't, that's not going to show anything. <laughs> uh, okay, I, now, well, now I'm laughing, semiotics. Uh. <coughs> yeah, like... Just, but in terms of argumentation, I just want to make a comment again on this. This sort of like argument, it's like very. I. If if you think about argument structure, you have to. Your conclusion can't be stronger than your premises. This, as a premise, is a very weak sentence. It's not like a uh, like this is something that everyone is going to like come up with it's just some random sense and any interpretation of it that you give is going to be okay but like it may not be universally accepted so that means you have like this very weak premise it's it's not gonna like hold a lot of weight so you can derive stuff from that but it has to be it can't as you can't get a conclusion that's gonna be like knock down drag out like you win argument because you didn't start from that sort of like you have to start from like good stuff to get like good conclusion you just do this is like weak stuff now you could get a good conclusion of weak stuff but like it has to be like super clever then this is not clever. Like, this is not super clever. It's just like, oh, they don't mean the same thing? Woo! Well, they don't mean the same thing in this sentence that you made up. But, like, the sentence that you made up does not mean anything about the rest of the world and how we understand the words. <laughs> Call them lawyers. Heathwood generalizes from case 
to the conclusion that it is reasonable to believe that no analysis of the moral in terms of the descriptive will be plausible. The second term that Heathwood presents is the paradigmatic epistemic term being reasonable. In this case, Heathwood offers a different verdict, maintaining that there is a realistic prospect of analyzing the meaning of sentences that employ this term by appeal to only descriptive concepts, such as concepts like concepts likely given my evidence. We can see this, Heathwood says, by employing this test. Is there some straw manning in there? I can't tell. That's a very fair question. I'm worried about that too. It, are these folks representing Heathwood's case like honestly and basically charitably? If they're just putting up like all the dumb things Heathwood says, um, then that's not so good. Because like you can cherry pick, of course, bad sentences. The problem is it doesn't um it I just don't it doesn't seem like they are because like it seems like they're going through Heathwood what Heathwood says by following Heathwood by following the next test uh this test and it's so this if it was like they did this once to Heathwood I'd say maybe the fact that they're just like hammering him to death means it's not a straw man it's a beat down this is a beat down that's what this paper is they're beating this guy down um maybe it's worth it maybe it's not i don't know that's a question i was gonna like hold off till till the end but like it's since you're bringing it up now what's happening here is this is a philosophical they're just stomping on him um and this is a philosophical stomp that as far as i can tell is actually they're doing it, um, they're not even mean. Th this isn't like, um, this isn't nasty, but they're stomping on them. <laughs> like, because if you want to get nasty, this paper wouldn't, you just, you, you can't like, <laughs> basically what happens is you just go through nitty gritty details and you just be like, he's wrong about this little thing that you get wrong about the next one, wrong about the next one, wrong about the next one, wrong about this one. And it's like, it's just terrible. Um, so, but like these people are just like this is like the big uh what I guess they think of as the big problems. Yeah. But well this is a, as a description of the way the paper is act what this paper actually is. They're stomping on this guy and what they're doing is they're squeezing him to get the uh their conclusion that the people who talk about this epistemic stuff um also have problems. Yeah. So, well, this is like, this is what I think, actually, let me, this is not a stomp, it's like a squeeze. They're like, they're, they're squeezing the juice at it, like this guy, um, he's the whipping horse so that they can get their conclusion. So that's what they're doing. They're, they're just beating, beating and squeezing him to get the juice out. Um, so, I don't know who Heathwood is, I hope he can take it. Probably can. I mean, you have to have thick skin as a philosopher, and academic in general. Okay, so let's see. This is the epistemic version of it. Um, epistemic OQA. The sentence, this is likely, given my evidence, but is not reasonable for me to believe it, is not self-contradictory. If E1, then reasonable for me to believe does not mean likely given my evidence. Therefore, reasonable, reasonable for me to believe does not, li does not mean likely given my evidence. Heathwood finds the epistemic OQA much less appealing than moral OQA, maintaining that E1 is probably false because it does not seem to have an air of incoherence sincerely to assert the sentence, this is likely given my evidence, but it's not reasonable for me to believe it. To illustrate his point, Heathwood offers the following example. Suppose I am having a visual experience uh, as of a table in front of me. Suppose that this is in fact makes it very likely that there is a table uh, that there is a table in front of me. Now I say, yes, see yes, I see that it's quite likely to be true that there is a table in front of me, but still I don't think it's reasonable for me to believe that there is a table in front of me. This is a puzzling thing to hear. It seems to be grounds for thinking that I do not really understand what I am saying. This is not at all how we how it is in the moral case. This suggests that it might be true that all that reasonable belief amounts to is likely truth and that analytic descriptivism is true of epistemic normativity. 
All right, and let me just uh, back to your point. You see how they added this nice big old quote right here showing that Heath Wood really does like this epistemic one here. Again, this is like this is why it's not a straw man because they're really showing that he was talking about it. <coughs> so, again, structure of this argument is, is like very well done. Having concluded that we have a good reason to reject the epistemic OQA because E1 appears to be false. Oh yeah, let me tell you what's going to happen. When the hammer drops, it's going to drop really hard because they haven't dropped it yet. I'm waiting. It's going to come in a while and we have, we're only on page 7 of like 30. Having, having concluded that we have a good reason to reject the epistemic OQA because E1 appears to be false, Heathwood proceeds to make... A last crucial point, which is that it doesn't matter whether his analysis of epistemic reasonability is exactly right or needs some further tinkering. What matters is that our semantic intuitions in the moral and epistemic cases are substantially different. In the moral OQA, we detect no incoherence in rejecting its second premise, but in the in case of the epistemic OQA, we do. Even if his account of reasonability reasonability needs further tinkering, Heathwood maintains that we can be optimistic that epistemic facts are just about just about likelihoods of some sort. And I want to make a quick uh, aside. This actually came up in the previous paper I read where they were saying, look, you can have conflicting moral stuff, but if you don't have, but if you have conflicting reason stuff, then you have a problem because you only have like one sort of like uh sort of rationality you don't think you have like two rationalities but you can have com uh, conflicting moral intuitions and that we do sort of think that that's the case here that isn't what was argued in this paper but it's a say it's a it's a like a line to hear people think there's something different when you're talking about like rationality this is epistemic though which isn't exactly rationality um but like that's kind of they think this is, it's sort of, uh, the, the two things are aligned. What happened last time? Okay, to sum up, suppose that we accept the assumption of analysis, holding that a true sentence reports a descriptive fact if and only if its semantic content can be analyzed solely in descriptive terms. If we do, Heathwood contends, we can locate an asymmetry between the epistemic and moral domains. The asymmetry is that while true epistemic sentences report descriptive facts, true moral sentences do not. If this is correct, Heathwood concludes that we have excellent reason to hold that while epistemic facts are descriptive, moral facts are not. But if this is so, then we have excellent reason to reject the parity premise in favor of the disparity uh, thesis. The difference again? Okay. So, the thing is, you can have, like, moral questions, and, like, you might not know what to do in, like, a ethical, you have, like, an ethical quandary. And so, you'd be like, oh, I don't know. Like, we've got different... Yeah, see, this is the thing. The epistemic versus logical. Like, when you have, like, these logical things, you... you... Well, no, on the moral side, you can have, like, moral questions. But if you have, like, a reasoning scheme, you have to follow the reasoning scheme because that is what the reasoning scheme says. If the reasoning se scheme says do A, you do A. There's no question about that. But if you have, like, an ethical scheme, you might actually have, like, conflicting, you know, moral duties to family, or you might not know what the greatest good is if you're, like, a utilitarian, and you've got, like, two outcomes that are maybe pretty equal, as far as you can tell. And then it's like you might have to go, like, try to figure something out. But, like, if you have, like, a, a reasoning scheme, and it comes up with an answer, you have to follow that. And so kind of going on, what's going on here is that, um... I think, well, again, these authors have not dropped the hammer yet. They just are saying, look, this is what the guy said. This is what Heath, Heathwood said. Basically, for, if something is reasonable for me to believe, that's the rationality claim. That's not really epistemic. Then it's likely given by evidence. This is the epistemic claim. And so the fact that you're kind of, you don't really want to separate out that your rationality is going to give you bad evidence because that's the whole point of it being rationality. Like, it wouldn't do that, like, just because that's the best you got. That's okay, but you don't... But on the ethical side, you say, hey, look, you know, sometimes 
you don't know exactly what the greatest good is. You don't always know what all your duties like should amount to. Um, so, and so sometimes good and something we desire, like your the things you desire, you're not always good. Like there's somehow there's some conflict there that doesn't that uh doesn't always uh line up. And so that's the point Heathwood's trying to make here. And this is a bigger point. Now, is exact is that point relevant to what Heathwood said in this paper? We'll see. I don't think so. But, like, that's what the authors are contending with. This is the distinction that somehow we feel that there's moral conflict that is different from rational conflict. Rational conflict, you can't, like, sort of disagree with your rationality, but you, you can sometimes be like, wait, is this really the best um, the most, the best, the the most good I can do, or is this really my duty? Like sometimes there's that sort of question, and this is, and the other part of it, air of incoherence. Like you can see, this is, um, I don't know if you how well you can see this, but they have a quote. It says, "Have an air of incoherence." This might as well be scare quotes as, like, just screaming to me. Look at this guy making crap up. I mean, I apologize for that. But it's just like, the guy's, in, he says, is my intuition is that one is different from the other. An air of incoherence. I mean, what, did you fart? So, yeah. All right, let's move on a little bit. Let's get somewhere. All right, so we get to the sum up. And so, yeah, if you believe all the stuff Heath could, Heathwood said, then you have excellent re- reason to reject the parity premise in favor of disparity and blah, blah, blah. All the things Heathwood wants. Okay. The first stage. <laughs> yes, Tropical Geek. In our exposition of Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis, we have tried to be max. <laughs> we have tried to be maximally conciliatory. Get that? Cinesemiotics? Maximally conciliatory. They've tried to be as nice as possible. We've conceded, for argument's sake, that the assumption of analysis is true. We've also raised no objections to the assumption that the open question argument could reliably give us insight into the nature of moral and epistemic facts. And what follows, we'll argue that even if we accept both these assumptions, we ought not be persuaded by Heathwood's challenge to the parody premise. Our response comes in three stages. In this section, we present the first stage, voicing several points of hesitation about Heathwood's case. Okay, and here comes the squeeze. They're granting Heathwood all the stuff, and now they're squeezing him to, like, hurt everyone else that, like, Heathwood is connected to. So that's what this whole argument is. They've set it up because they don't want to stomp on Heathwood. They want to stomp on everyone else. Or they want to get like they want to get the juice out of everyone else. So they're they're they set Heathwood up. They accepted all of Heathwood's uh basically all Heathwood's arguments, but now they're gonna squeeze those arguments because they have uh wider consequences. Okay. At the outset of our discussion, we noted that Heathwood presents non-reductive realists with what seemed to be a difficult choice, either give up on Cuneo's core argument or the open question argument. The first point that we would like to make is that there is good reason to believe that non-reductive realists, by which at this juncture we mean non-naturalist moral realists, face no such choice. This is because all non-naturalists hold that a. When something is a reason to believe, intend, or act, then it, its being a reason is not a descriptive fact. And I just want to read this. Tropical Geek says, Philosophical pimple popping. I feel like that should be my next go live message. <coughs> so, when something is a reason to believe, intend, or act, then its being a reason, that is, its having the property of being a reason, is not a descriptive fact. The rationale for A, according to non-naturals, is that there are no there are not multiple types of reason properties. There is only one type of reason property, and it is the property of being such as to favor or being such as to justify. And this property, non-naturals contend, is not a descriptive property. However, suppose Heathwood is right in epistemic facts, including the fact that something is, that has the property of being a reason to believe, are descriptive. 
and suppose, as Heathwood himself indicates, that his argument commits non-naturals to the claim, given our evidence, it is likely that epistemic descriptum is true, Given A, it would follow that B could not be a reason, that is, have the property of being a reason, to believe epistemic descriptivism. Indeed, it would follow that, given A, for any claim whatsoever, the fact that claim is likely given our evidence could not be, that is, have a property of being, a reason to believe it. Among the claim that non-naturalists endorse, though, is C, Given our evidence, non-naturalism is more likely than its rivals. Okay, let me just go back over this real, real quick. Because <laughs> it's funny. They, let's see. So, they pulled out a uh, non-naturalist hold that there is no, there are no sort of uh, pr- these <laughs> certain properties. <laughs> and then the, the certain properties that don't actually exist are the ones that Heathwood needs to make his argument go through. Okay. <sighs> okay. Among the claims that non-naturalists do endorse, though, is given our evidence that non-naturalism is more likely than its rivals. But if C is true, then C could not be, that is, have the property of being, a reason to believe non-naturalism. This implication, however, would leave non-naturalists in a bind, as it's not clear what other reason non-naturalists could have or offer to believe their view, especially if entailment relations are also descriptive, as Heathwood claims. By all appearances, then, it looks as if epistemic descriptivism is not a view that is amenable to moral non-naturalists, contrary to what Heathwood claims. Huh. Yeah, so, this is a little technical, but... But it's interesting. And it's interesting because, look, you... Yeah, see, you just have to know about what's going on, though. And that makes it a little hard. But basically, you can only... If it's only descriptive, then you can't actually use it as a reason for believing anything. You're just describing stuff like sky is blue. But why would you believe something about the rest of the world just because of the way you're describing the sky? And so they can't use it as a reason to actually believe their own theories, if that is what their theory is made of. Mm-hmm. We present this not as a decisive objection to Heathwood's argument, but only as a point of hesitation regarding it. The reason is that non-naturalists could, in principle, revise their view, maintaining that there are not one but two types of reason properties, one that is wholly descriptive and one that is not. In that case, non-naturalists could hold that while there are no non-descriptive reasons to believe their view on other claims, there are descriptive reasons to do so. Now, as a matter of fact, prominent moral non-naturalists such as David Enoch and Derek Parfit reject this approach for what strikes us as good reasons given their non-naturalism. But our intent here is not to establish that these philosophers are correct to claim that there are only non-descriptive reasons. Rather, it is only to draw attention to the fact that the disparity thesis sits uneasily with non-naturalism. Alright, again, let me point out the argumentation. I like this sort of stuff. You see how their argument went. They didn't argue from some, like, sentence that they made up and then they had, like, some, and generalized to very strong things. They took all of the given stuff, and then argued that there was a problem, but it was only something, their problem wasn't knocked down, they didn't generalize, they said, look, people do contend about this, but they're not making big claims of it, they're just saying, look, people know this, and it's a problem, so we're not saying Heathwood is wrong here, we're just saying there's problems, and other people know about these problems too, you see, they didn't go, like, crazy, they went very they started from like solid ground and then they just sort of whittled away till there was a problem and then they didn't do anything else. They just said they just revealed that there was a problem and they're not saying it's a decisive objection. Not as a decisive objection. Just a, you know, this is just like this is the first step in like their uh, squeeze. It's like you should not feel so good about your claim, Heathwood. 
we turn to our second point of hesitation. Suppose for argument's sake that while the moral OQA establishes that the fact that something is good is not descriptive, the epistemic OQA establishes the fact that it is reasonable to believe a proposition is descriptive. What would follow? Well, note that our propositional attitudes can display a wide variety of epistemic merits and demerits, such as being a case of knowledge, certain, warranted, reliably formed, virtuous, and justified. Moreover, in addition to having epistemic merits, our propositional attitudes can be supported by evidence or reasons, these being what favor or justify our having one or another propositional attitude. In the context of the present dialectic, the diversity of of epistemic merits is significant for it has at least this implication. Given this diversity, we cannot move from the claim that we have furnished a successful descriptive analysis of the concept of being reasonable to the further claim that similar analyses are available for whatever other epistemic concepts there may be. This is actually what I claimed, that the sentence was kind of a weak sentence, that it was like a setup. There's too many ways that you could make one of those like sentences above that uh, I said were very weak. And this is why they were weak. I, I, this is what I, uh, what I was talking about. Admittedly, admittedly, a successful descriptive analysis in one case might license optimism, boosting confidence that analysis of other epistemic merits will be forthcoming. We would, however, counsel caution about drawing any general conclusions on the basis of such confidence, mostly because the various epistemic merit concepts appear to differ widely. Consider, for example, a broadly externalist epistemic merit concept such as being reliably formed. It is fairly easy to imagine being offered a descriptive analysis of such a concept, the reliably formed belief simply being the one that is produced by a process faculty virtue that yields a preponderance of true beliefs. But now consider the moral internalist concept that Richard Foley calls rationality and Nicholas Walter St Walter Storff, I apologize, calls entitlement. In this case, it is not so easy to imagine being offered a successful descriptive analysis for the concept that these philosophers have in mind is thoroughly deontological, applying them applying to an agent when excuse me, applying to an agent when and only when she has not been negligent or irresponsible in forming, maintaining, or modifying her doxastic attitudes. Or to put the point we wish to make more modestly, one could imagine being offered the crucial details of an ambitious reductive program in which the concept of entitlement is reduced to or explained solely in terms of descriptive concepts. However, absent being offered these details, which Heathwood himself does not furnish, it is not easy to imagine what such a case would look like. Yeah, so, it's that language is complicated, what people mean by these things has gotten extremely complicated, and so getting generalized like big conclusions out of like a single sentence unless you're just a linguist unless you're a linguist like it's not really it's going to be hard the point we are pressing is important we believe because deontic concepts such as entitlement are fundamental not only to our practices of epistemic evaluation such as when we hold people accountable for ignoring the evidence available to them, but also to our understanding of other epistemic concepts such as knowledge. Think, for example, of how those who advocate a prominent strand of virtue epistemology understand knowledge. According to these philosophers, when an agent knows a proposition P, When an agent knows a proposition P, her belief that P must not only be true, but also be the output of an epistemically virtuous doxastic process or faculty in hospitable conditions. Nearly all accounts of knowledge of this sort, however, specify that a belief is virtuously formed only when an agent has not formed it in a negligent fashion, or any other vicious fashion that is, narrow, for example, narrow-mindedly. Narrow if this is so, then epistemic concepts such as knowledge being virtuously formed and being entitled are enmeshed in such a way that if a descriptive analysis of the last is not forthcoming, then neither are descriptive analyses of the former. Yeah, alright, so this is all the same. Okay. Our second point of hesitation, then, is that given the variety of epistemic merit concepts that appear importantly different, a successful descriptive analysis of the concept being reasonable would provide little reason to accept epistemic descriptivism. We now turn to our third point of hesitation, 
which is that any attempt to analyze the concept of being reasonable, excuse me, that any attempt to analyze the concept of being reasonable in terms of the likelihood of a proposition given an agent's evidence needs to specify which of an agent's evidence bears upon the likelihood of that proposition. The concern we harbor is that when we specify which evidence matters, Heathwood's proposal no longer appears to be a version of epistemic descriptivism. Eh, okay. For note that it won't simply it won't do simply to propose that it is reasonable for you to believe a proposition P if and only if P is most likely given some subset of your available sentence. Um, I, you know, it's an interesting question. I've thought of different ways of doing it, Tropical Geek. The answer is no, because I have to read the paper. Like, we could, like, you could, like, read it out and I could just, like, yell at you and over the, uh, like the auto reader and it would give me more avail- availability to chat but you know just interrupt me if you want to chat that's cool and I actually I'm fine it is hard today it, I'm sick <laughs> and and it's actually the writing too like this is um the writing is um not for whatever reason this is proper english but it's stilted for me and i don't think it's i think because this was written not to be read out loud this has this i can almost guarantee you i think this was put in like a this has never been this was not this was part of a um anthology i don't think this was ever like given as like a presentation and so like this is not this is I don't think this was ever given as a um like a, as as a talk this is never been ri- I, I this may be the first time anyone's reading it aloud the whole way through like I can tell just by the way it's going and so I'm sick today and B I don't I think it's actually particularly bad in terms of uh reading out loud it's perfectly fine english and it's very clear but um for, as for as far as the performance goes yeah i know i i feel it too <laughs> yeah i was in bed for like two days <sighs> no i'm sure it's, some poor schmuck reviewer had to re- like oh well I actually I can't even guarantee that anyone read the book um before it got published. I hope the authors read it once through one last time. I mean someone had to do grammar checks. I mean look for look at the there's no punctuation in the sense because you could say for note comma or for note that it's simply won't do oh no it won't do simply you see where the simply is put here it like it simply won't do now it won't do simply like who it where the words are put <laughs> peer review oh my god yeah but see this is the thing so you can so like there could have been like punctuation here that um is not here um, the simply is basically sl- a few words out of position, in my opinion. Um, you could, you could say it simply won't do. Um, and it won't, because it, it won't do simply to propose. Um, now it could make a, a difference in the rest of the sentence, but like, this is why it's, uh, I'm out of practice. I'm not well. Um, n- you know, I actually... Cinesemiotics, I'd say it's, these are all, it might be, um, but I mean, I actually, I don't, th- I bet Terrence Cuneo is like, I, I feel like these are, I don't, actually, I think these are actually native speakers. What I think it is, is it's uh, written by committee. Written by committee is all, like, these are not, um, this is not foreign language mistakes. This is written by committee mistakes. Two people were writing this, and no one was writing it in their voice. They were writing it together. So, I don't think, um... 
it, that's what it feels like. It feels like things are getting moved around because that's how it works best with people working together and not one person like uh, sounding it out themselves. Oops, sorry about that. Yee. But yeah, and so that is the, uh, I mean, my biggest complaint is sometimes when things are not easily readable uh, out loud, but like, of course, that has nothing to do with like philosophy. Also, for meaning because, yeah, like exactly. So it's like these it's just little things that uh, if one person was writing and then they had to go reread it themselves, they would take out. But like if it's multiple people, you know, you just leave it in. It's like someone else's work. Yeah. And th there's not enough punctuation in some spots. And like the pacing is all wrong. Like that's the thing. It's, like, it's a stilted pacing. So. We meme for weird memes, yeah. So, that that's just part of the issue. That's one of the one of the problems here is just I can't read it, and I should be able to. I'm not that sick at the moment. I'm I'm a bit tired, but like, yeah. So, I don't know, but like, you y you have a point, tropical geek. All right, but let's keep going then. I have to like get through this, and I'm ready a hour and over an hour in. For note that it would won't simply, won't see. I can't do it. For note that it won't do simply to propose that it is reasonable for you to believe a proposition P if and only if P is most likely given some subset of your available evidence. Now I'm gonna get through this. I'm not feeling that bad. Cryonics, <laughs> tires. Yeah. Thank you, Cynosemionic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this proposal is. Too indiscriminate since we need to know which subset is in question. But it is no better to propose that it is reasonable for you to believe P, if and only if P, is most likely given all of your available evidence since this proposal is similarly indiscriminate. After all, for, for just about any proposition and agent, there is a vast amount of evidence available to that agent for that proposition which she cannot reasonably ex be expected to take into account. Thank you, Tropical Geek, for the 100 bits. Getting a lot of bits today. More bit. Yeah, this is like my biggest, like, Cinesamiotics, thank you again for the 200 bits. I've almost got a hype train started. <laughs> I, oh, it does not show up. <coughs> it doesn't show up on this new chat. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, my God, that's so sad. Yeah, the, one sec. Let me, if I, I might go back to my old, uh, What is oh there we go hype train <laughs> it is close so that's exciting this is the old chat in the um actually one, hold on one sec let's just say I want to see if it says hype train here oh you see you've got slightly different animations I think on this one okay. One more person needs to sub gift or use bits. Yeah, this is the uh, one of the largest number of bits and donations by like um like n number of quantity. Yeah. Oh. Oof. So yeah. But thank you. Whoa! Was that another three hundred bits? What just happened? Got another 300 bits, it says. Ah, thank you. I th No, I think someone new needs to do it, unfortunately. Like, I don't know if, like, we've got enough people in chat to, like, if that's going to give me more bits. Uh, yeah. Not sure. Thank you, though. <laughs> um, yeah, like, because since you all started doing it at once... Let's see. All right. Well, let's see. Thank you, Tropical Geek. Okay, give me money back. Uh, checks in the mail, send a semiotics. <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea how that would work. I, I mean, I would if you weren't kidding, but like, yes. <coughs> Thank you. All right, let me, let's try to get through this because... 
this is like yeah i mean th- i think there's a very good work here but like um, the fact that i can't like do it well is unfortunate and i feel like yeah written by committee which is annoying <sighs> yeah all right so look if you can't cherry pick which evidence you're using is what they're saying here so to take a variant of heathwood's earlier case no cher- yeah this is a ch- they're saying heathwood's cherry picking is what they're cl- accusing him of he's saying you can't pick which pick and choose which evidence to look at so imagine that you walk into a room have the visual experience as of a table and immediately form the belief that there is a table in front of me Suppose, however, that among the evidence available to you is a small placard posted outside the room in which you have entered, which states that you are about to view a masterful trompe l'oeil mural that contains an image of a table. Given all your available evidence, it follows that the proposition that there is a table in front of me is not likely, and thus, according to Heathwood's proposal, it is not reasonable for you to believe that there is a table in front of you. But by all appearances, it is reasonable for you to believe that there is a table before you. By no fault of your own or your eyes, you simply miss taking into account some evidence, but not all, some available but not easily detectable information. See right here, like, this is what I'm talking about. Some available but not easily detectable information. This should have been italicized or put like, um... You know, like, a, what's it called? Oh, actually, I, should, I probably can just edit this. I'm on page 13 of this busts it. Stop. Okay. Up, oh, and I did bust it. That's fine. I'll be right back. Yeah, so this is just why I uh, like point out some available but not easily detectable information. So this could have been either italicized or like, you know, you can do one of these deals and that sets it apart and that would have helped me out. Or also, I mean, you guys can't see that. Or you could have done something like this. You know, just easy dashes even if you can't have it um, like like that. And there's almost none of that in this entire thing. Now, one of the things is maybe this is part of their book deal. Who knows? But, like, yeah. This is a very, very sparsely um, uh, punctuated paper. <coughs> I mean, this is why we can't have nice things. It makes a huge difference, the formatting. Like, I can't even tell you sometimes exactly, like... Oh, that was a mistake. Gotta get this over. There we go. Okay. Before moving forward, let's acknowledge that some philosophers appear to reject the argument just offered, holding that rational or justified belief is determined by an agent's total evidence. We have two things to say about such a denial. First... The view that rational or justified belief is determined by an agent's total evidence might be plausible if it is propositional rationality or justification that is in question, since whether a proposition is justified might be a function of the total evidence for it. It is, however, much less plausible to hold that doxastic justification or rationality is determined by an agent's total evidence, since it is not apparent how an agent could base a belief on her total evidence. Such evidence often... Such evidence often being too vast for any fallible agent to take into account. See that first dash right here? And it they needed to because this would have uh, broken the sentence. But otherwise. By all appearances, however, Heathwood's descriptivist proposal concerns not propositional but doxastic, ration, reason, doxastic reasonability. It, if it... It follows that even if propositional justification or rationality were determined by one's total evidence, we could not conclude that the reasonability of an agent's having a belief is determined by that agent's total evidence. Why would they post a paper if you can't cite it? Um, they can post the... Well, that's a technical question, actually. You can post the second-to-last version of your paper that goes to publication. The publication has right of has the right of like the citable version but then they can send this one out so that 
everyone can actually read their work. Like, there might be very, very small changes between this one and the next one, but the, like, one of record is the, um... You have you have to cite the one that was published, not this version of it. But that's because the you know the journal has to get theirs, or the book uh, publisher has to get theirs, so that they want people to go out and buy the book to actually be able to cite the thing. Um, yeah, um, this is in, this is forthcoming in meta epistemology. So that's what I think. This is in a. Um, Anthology on meta epistemology. So, but yeah, no, no, this is standard practice, and I love people who do this because otherwise, no one's going out and buying all these books. Like, that's nuts. Oh, uh, where was I? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if you can't, of course you can't, like, uh, appeal to everything in your mind at once. Okay, by all appearances, however, Heathwood's descriptivist proposal concerns not propositional, but doxastic reasonability. It follows that even if propositional justification or rationality were determined by one's total evidence, we could not conclude that the reasonability of an agent's having a belief is determined by that agent's total evidence. Second, suppose it were true that a Beliefs having a doxastic merit, such as being justified, is determined by an agent's total evidence. It would follow that the doxastic merit, being reasonable, which we are understanding along broadly deontic lines, would also be determined by an agent's total evidence. That would follow, follow only if one identified reasonability with justification, think, thinking of the latter along deontic lines. But if one does think of justification along deontic lines, then the line of argument above has a above has a bite. One could be justified in the sense of being epistemically in the clear, even when, when one fails non-culpably to take into account one's total evidence. Hmm. Yeah, so you could be like, oops, I, f I ignored that, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we need a better option, one that is more discriminant in character than those we've considered. In our judgment, the only way forward is to specify that, when it comes to reasonability, it is one's relevant evidence that matters. In this, If this is right, Heathwood's proposal would come to this. It is reasonable for you to believe P shares the same semantic content as P is most likely given your, re given your relevant evidence. There is a problem facing RS, though. RS, however, which is that the evidence that is relevant for you is not simply the evidence that you actually have or take into account when believing P. Rather, it is the evidence that you ought to have or take into account when believing P. Indeed, under one plausible interpretation, to say that some evidence is what you ought to have or take into account is not to say that it is evidence which you would have or take into account were you perfectly rational or occupied idealized or occupied idealized conditions since Reasonable agents can fail to exhibit perfect rationality. Rather, the relevant evidence is what we who understand your circumstances could reasonably expect you to have or take into account. If this is right, then there is really a twofold problem that faces Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis. First, RS does not even have the appearance of a, implying a version of epistemic descriptivism, since the right-hand side of RS expresses not simply descriptive concepts, but also by all, by all appearances, normative ones. Second, under a very plausible reading of RS, uh, reading RS as circular, since it attempts to analyze the concept of reasonability in terms of the very same concept. While circularity of this sort probably does not render RS uninformative, no case for the disparity thesis could appeal to RS so understood. Okay, so this whole thing ha has like just been coming down. This is still just saying that Heathwood picked and choosed his like his examples, and these are just problems that come with when you get to pick and choose your examples a little too uh, cavalierly. And so, yeah, that's this whole thing was like a lot of just a lot of talking to say that but like you know this is philosophy you have to get very 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 into the weeds here okay 
we conclude this section by adding a pair of caveats. The first is that by putting forward RS as our most promising gloss of the concept being reasonable, we don't take ourselves to have offered a satisfactory analysis of this concept. In all likelihood, if anything approaching adequate analysis is available, it would have to incorporate still other nuances into RS, such as the proviso that to be reasonable in believing P, you must be leave P on the basis of your relevant evidence. The second caveat would we add is that by highlighting the apparent normative dimensions of RS, we do not wish to suggest that there is no satisfactory descriptive analysis of the concept relevant evidence and hence the concept being reasonable. Our aspirations are much more modest. We wish, on, we wish to maintain only that the line of argument that Heathwood presents does not provide any reason to believe that such descriptive analysis is forthcoming and that at best RS is not a clear case of such an analysis. In the next section, we explain in more detail why even this modest conclusion presents problems for Heathwood's case for the disparity claim. Okay, so what happened is Heathwood made those arguments, and they spotted that those arguments were bad, but they argue, they realized that the arguments were bad in such a good way for them that they got this nice little claim here. They got to this RS thing. This RS thing is that it is reasonable for you to believe P shares the same semantic content as P is the most likely given your relevant evidence. But this is not a very, like, this might be interesting, but it's not a good, it's not what Heathwood, Heathwood wants, and it's going to be damaging, actually. That this is the version that is actually what's being argued for by Heathwood, and it's a damaging thing. So it's like he made himself a poison pill. Ah. Okay. <clears throat> so now they're, this is, uh, see, they're employing it themselves. This is a revenge argument that's coming back to bite them. Uh, in the last section, okay, so we're, well, we're more than halfway through. Good. Because <laughs> we're an hour and a half in. Not an easy paper. In the last section, we said that our response to Heathwood's challenge to the parody premise would come in three stages. In this section, we did develop the second stage of our response. Our primary objective in this stage is to build upon some of the concerns raised in the last section, casting more doubt on Heathwood's employment of the open question argument. To be clear, see, look at this. See this right here? That's a comma. They started using commas in the last, like, little bit. This means, like, I bet different people wrote this, or, or it was written at a different time. So, this is what happened. I mean, it's just, now there's commas before there were no commas. To be clear, our objective in this section is not to raise objections to the open question argument itself, contending that it is not the sort of argument that could vindicate epistemic descriptivism. Rather, it is to raise some concern about Heathwood's employment of this argument in favor of, in favor of epistemic descriptivism. Heathwood, recall, employs a version of the open question argument to establish an asymmetry between the epistemic and moral domains. Maintaining that while epistemic concepts and facts are descriptive, moral concepts and facts are not. Stated somewhat differently, the asymmetry that Heathwood wishes to establish is that the epistemic domain admits of a reductive analysis while the moral domain does not. By claiming that Heathwood wishes to defend a reductive analysis of the epistemic domain, we do not wish simply to point out that, in Heathwood's view, epistemic sentences and descriptive sentences share the same semantic content. After all, to point out that the term race means comp competition with respect to speed of movement would hardly count as advocating a reduction of the concept race. Reductions and... See? Another... Like I say, all of a sudden, we're getting more punctuation. Reductions and here we have in mind in mind so-called conceptual reductions, which analyze the semantic content of one term or sentence in terms of the semantic content of another, typically require more than mere identity of semantic content between terms or sentences. They also typically require that, with regard to any putative analysis, there's sufficient apparent conceptual distance between its uh, alan <laughs> and that la I gotta say the Latin, analizandum and analizans, such that it comes with some surprise, at least to the uninitiated, that its analizandum expresses the same semantic content as an analizans. This means is the uh, thing that was analyzed and the thing that is, um, thing to be analyzed and then the thing the and then the analysis. That's what these two Latin things means. And don't don't ask me which ones which. I always get them mixed up. So like the Alan. Let's see, the explanands and the explanandum. 
the explanations is the word. So the analysis analysand is the thing to be analyzed, and the analysandum is, I think, the analysis of it. Yeah, that's right, Tropical Geek. <coughs> I mean, the fact that there's a question, why do we need to use those words right here? Um, and if they're not used in the rest of the paper, maybe it's just, you know, uh, we'll see if it, if they get used again, like that's fine. But like, I don't like throwing in Latin just because you can. Yeah, that's right. Typical geek. <laughs> Ideally, we would like to have a detailed account of how to unpack the use of the metaphor of conceptual distance in this context and how much apparent distance there must be between an anal Okay, so we are using them. An analyzandum and an anal analyzands for there to be a reduction of the former to the latter, of the explanation, you're reducing the explanation to the thing explained. Or is it the thing explained to the explanation? We'll see. Unfortunately, we have no such account and must settle for simply noting the following, which we take to suffice for our current purposes. Like the concept of evidence and, pro and probable, the notion of the con excuse me, the notion of conceptual distance is gradable coming in degrees. Since this is so, the concept expressed by one phrase can bear more or less apparent distance from the concept expressed by another phrase. Moreover, while we have no account of how much apparent distance there must be between an analyzandum and an analyzands for some proposed proposal to account to count as a reduction of the former to the latter, we have a paradigm example with which to work. If we could reduce the concept expressed by the phrase mental state to that expressed by the phrase complex of behavioral dis dispositions, for example, that would be a case in which there is sufficient apparent distance to constitute a reduction of the former to the latter. Hey, Valco. Yeah, uh, Cuneo was actually suggested by um, one of the other uh, chat members today. I think it might have been, uh, was it Cryonics who suggested it? So, yeah. <coughs> I mean, I think it's very well argued. I'm having some stumbling blocks on the, uh, yeah, it was Cryonics. Thank you, Cryonics. Um, on the language sometimes. It feels like it was written by committee and, uh, like, I can't read some sentences. They're, like, a little stilted. But what are you going to do? But other than that, it's like, uh, I think I've uh, been complimenting the, uh, argumentation. It's been solid. How you doing, by the way? Hope all's well in Valpo land. I'm getting over a kind of nasty stomach bug. So, if I collapse, that's what it was. Yeah, so oh, yeah, a quick rundown is, um, let's see, what are we doing here? Oh, there's this Heathwood character who criticized them, and they were like, sort of, I think, poking at Heathwood's argument and realized that they could squeeze it and get a, uh, their criticism of Heathwood's arguments would have wider consequences. And so basically, this is what we've just turned on to the, now they're getting to their consequences of their criticisms. So. Okay. With that notice, return to Heathwood's employment of the open question argument. Recalling that its purpose is to establish an asymmetry between the moral and epistemic domains. To establish this, <laughs> last week was brutal webinars, MR, ugh, Monday, th oh, yeesh, two weeks into fall semester, yeah. I mean, people don't realize how nasty, like, getting school started is. It's just tough. But good, 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 good. Recalling, okay, I'm continuing. Oh. There, oh boy. I'll feel it in the morning. <sighs> Recalling that its purpose is to establish an asymmetry between the moral and epistemic domains. To establish this asymmetry, Heathwood's employment of this argument would have to provide good reason 
to hold that epistemic concepts admit of a reductive analysis, while moral concepts do not. It seems to us, however, that we have no such reasons. To the contrary, it seems to us that we have as much reason to believe that we can furnish a reductive analysis of epistemic concepts as we have to believe that we can furnish a reductive analysis of moral concepts. There is, so far that we can tell, no asymmetry between epistemic and moral concepts in their respect. Perhaps the best way to articulate this point is to work with a series of comparisons. Begin by considering the following trio of putative reductions, each of which attempts to reductively analyze the semantic content and express by the phrase, it is reasonable for you to believe P. Proximate. It is reasonable for you to believe P shares the same semantic content as you ought to believe P given your evidence. Less proximate. It is reasonable for you to believe P shares the same semantic content as P is most likely given your relevant evidence. Distant. It is relevant. It is reasonable for you to believe P shares the same semantic content as it is coherent for you to believe P. So we've gotten an ought, a likelihood, and a coherence claim. These comparisons may suggest a rough tripartite scale of conceptual distance. Proximate might succeed as an analysis of semantic content of the phrase it is reasonable for you to believe P, but it fails as a reductive analysis because its analyzand dumb and analyzands express very similar, similar normative concepts. It should come as no surprise that the phrase being reasonable and being what, ought, being what one ought to believe share similar meanings. Less proximate, which represents a modified version of Heathwood's proposal, is different. It might succeed at securing a meaning identity, and it might also succeed as a reduction. Whether it does will entirely depend on whether the notion of relevant evidence can be understood solely in solely descriptive terms. In the last section, we raised the concern that we have not been offered any reason to believe that it can. At best, less proximate, we claimed, appears to be an inconclusive case of a reductive analysis. Finally, distant clearly fails as an analysis and hence as a reductive analysis of reasonable since there is no prospect of distance con constituent phrases sharing the same semantic content. Yet yeah, why would reasonability and coherence inherently um, mean the same thing? That said, if these phrases were to share the same semantic content, we would have excellent reason to hold that distance succeeds as a reductive analysis since there is sufficient apparent distance between the concepts expressed by the terms reasonable and coherent. So yeah, these two words, reasonable and coherent, it's like, well, yeah, if you can show that reasonable just means coherent, you've done a lot of impressive work. Like, that would be, you'd be famous. Okay, we can replicate the same dynamic in the moral domain. Take, for example, Heathwood's own candidate of a paradigmatic moral concept, specific like viz. What are we calling viz? I'll say specifically, being good. Since one common way of way to think of something's goodness is in terms of the attitude that it merits, let's use the phrase being prized to stand for a variety of attitudes an agent might have towards something such as admiring, desiring, it, cherishing, and the like. Now considering the following tri trio of putative reductions. Proximate. X is morally good, shares the same semantic content as X merits being prized. Less proximate. X is morally good, shares the same semantic content as X would be prized by an ideal agent in idealized conditions. Distant. X is morally good, shares the same semantic content as X would be prized by you and me. Proximate might succeed as an analysis of X is morally good, but it fails as a reductive analysis because its analyzandum and its analyzands express very similar normative concepts as proponents of the so-called buck-passing accounts have urged. Phrases such as being morally good and, mer and merits being prized are very close in meaning. Less proximate, so... Yeah, this, this makes sense. 
less proximate, in contrast, might succeed at identifying two phrases that share the same semantic content, and it might succeed as a reductive analysis. But if it does, everything will depend on whether the notion of idealized can be unpacked in a purely descriptive terms, which remains to be seen. Like its epistemic analog, then, it appears to be an inconclusive case of reductive analysis. Existent finally clearly fails as an analysis, and hence as a reductive analysis, of X is morally good. That noted, if it were su to succeed as an analysis, it would appear to be genuinely reductive, as the phrase X would be prized by you and me seems to express purely descriptive content. Okay. So... You know, this is just hammering examples. But I mean, again, it's like it, you can generate a lot of examples and they're showing we can, they were just generating counter examples. So they, we conclude that Heathwood's employment of the open question argument fails to establish any interesting asymmetry between the epistemic and moral domains. In both cases, we can identify plausible candidates for one genuine analyses that are not reductive because the analysands employs normative concepts very similar to that employed in the analysandum, two, putative, putative analyses that are inconclusively reductive because the analysands incorporate, incorporates concepts that might well be normative, and three, putative analyses that are not reductive because they are not genuine analyses at all. In the last section, we argued that, at best, Heathwood's own proposal regarding the meaning of reasonable falls into the second inconclusive category. In this regard, it is no different from candidates that philosophers have offered, candidates fr that philosophers have offered for understanding the semantic content expressed by the term good, such as being prized by an idealized, uh, idealized agent in idealized conditions. If this is so, then the parity premise emerges unscathed. Even if we assume that the open question argument reveals to us the nature of normative facts, we see little reason to believe that the epistemic facts are descriptive while moral facts are not. I right, have one comment on this section. If you, you know, if you fight with pigs, you, you roll around in the mud. This was not a... This was not, like, poorly argued, but this is just not interesting argumentation here. This is just going over, like, this is wrong, like, or we can do this too, like, we can play the same game as you. That's like we could play the same game as you and get our conclusion that we want. The question is, do you want to play that game? And so this argument here is like, yeah, you got your answer, but you shouldn't have been in this fight right here. Like, I think um, obviously these are clever people, and I really like this paper in terms of the argumentation. I think it was like this is well thought out, but um. Let me tell you something, I hate the concept of conceptual distance, I won't touch it with a 10-foot pole, for the exact reason why I read this paragraph, it's just like, it just, you're just going over this sort of like, example of example that doesn't really make sense, and that's the way you end up arguing here. So it's like, I avoid these arguments, not because they're not bad arguments and shouldn't be criticized, but I'll find some other way to do it. Any other way, I'll find some other way. And it's like, you picked an argument and it worked, but like, it, did you feel good when you wrote these paragraphs? Probably not. So, I mean, you got your conclusion. But like, um, yeah. It's like, you shouldn't have done, it's like, you shouldn't have done it because it's just unpleasant. Okay. Okay. So now they're onto their third stage. <coughs> And it's an hour and 45 minutes, still not done with this. This is turning into a longer paper than I thought. Let's see how much farther we go. We are on page 21, the very bottom of 21. You gotta get to... Okay, we gotta get to the bottom of 27. So six more pages. Let's uh, get through that and we'll be done with this one. Mm. Where are we? Here we go. The third stage, probability. And anyone still watching? Can, <laughs> anyone still up? Thank you for sticking with it. But uh, in my like sort of addled brained sick state. Um. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So. Feel free to ask questions. Let me know what you think. 
the third stage, probability. We've been pressing the case that we should resist Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis, arguing that when we identify a plausible candidate for the meaning of reasonable, there is no interesting asymmetry between the epistemic and moral domains. There is, however, one last issue worth exploring that Heathwood himself canvases, and that is whether the concept of probability is itself descriptive. Heathwood said that probability is itself descriptive? What the hell does that mean? Anyway. If we fail to have good reasons to believe that it is, then we would have yet another reason to resist Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis, since we would have good reason to believe that analyzing the concept reasonable in terms of the concept probable would not count as a genuinely descriptive analysis. In this, the third stage of our response, we contend that Heathwood's case for the claim that the notion of probability that the notion of probability is descriptive fails. Okay. Heathwood recognizes that it is a live question whether the concept probable is descriptive. Since he takes it to be evident that probability is not a normative but a descriptive notion, writing that if probability were normative, then it would be a subjective notion that is indexed to the attitudes of agents. But, Heathwood continues, this does not appear to be a plausible understanding of probability. Its main problem is that it founders on an epistemic variant of Plato's youth of problem. Suppose we look out the window and see that the streets are wet. We conclude that it probably rained, which seems right. That it is true that it probably rained in virtue of the fact that it is reasonable to believe that it rained, or that it is reasonable to believe that it rained in virtue of the fact that it probably rained. Surely the latter is correct. Facts about what is probably, probably true are more basic, and indeed, we use these facts deciding what to believe, that is, in deciding what is reasonable to believe. We explain why it would be reasonable to believe something by establishing that the thing is probably true and not the other way around. Um, is that really what we do? Is reasonable to believe that it rained in virtue of the fact that it probably rained? Uh, I don't know if people actually think about, like, what probably happened first. I mean... It might be a good idea like when you're deliberating, but I'm actually not even sure that this is like a fact of how people do things though. If you're facts about probably true or more basic, I mean on what sense of basic then I mean I don't don't listen to ethicists when they're talking about probability. Go look, go talk to the, the philosophers of probability. <laughs> like really, like there's people that's like all they do. But anyway, there are three claims being stated or assumed in this passage. The first is that there is one relevant notion of probability for analyzing the concept being reasonable. The second is that this notion is one according to which probability facts are not relative to evidence or dependent on the mental states of agents. They are not subjective but objective patterns of the world. The third claim is that probability facts are not normative but descriptive. Strictly speaking, these claims are logically independent of one another, but it's worth noting that if probability facts were objective patterns in the world, it would be much easier to see how they could be descriptive since the existence and nature of these patterns would be entirely independent of our evidence. If, by contrast, the existence and nature of probability facts were contingent on our evidence, then it would be much more difficult to see how they could be purely descriptive since we would once again face the question of, whether, of which evidence is relevant for determining these facts. We submit that Heathwood's proposal regarding probability is subject to a dilemma. Suppose, on the one hand, we attempt to analyze the concept being reasonable by appeal to an objective, intrinsic account of probability, as Heathwood suggests. If we do, then we will not be able to fashion an adequate analysis of the concept being reasonable. Suppose, on the other hand, we attempt to analyze the concept being reasonable by appeal to a continuous conditional epistemic account of probability. If we do, then we might arrive at an adequate analysis of this concept. That analysis, however, would provide no reason to believe that probability facts are descriptive. To the contrary, we'll suggest that it would provide reason to believe that such facts are normative, in which case Heathwood's case for the disparity thesis would collapse. We begin with the dilemma's first form, which appeals to two variations of a biased coin thought experiment. Okay, so... All right, fine. Let's see how they play this out. Here's the first version. Suppose that a coin either has heads on both sides or that has tails on both sides, but you don't know which. Suppose, for argument's sake, that the coin has tails on both sides. It follows that no matter what evidence you have, the objective intrinsic probability of the coin coming up tails is 1. 
and thus according to RS, it is reasonable for you to believe that the coin will come up tails. But of course, it is not reasonable for you to believe this because you have no evidence for this claim. Hence, RS is false. Uh, beliefs being objectively probable is not sufficient for it to be reasonable. Here is the second version of the thought experiment. Imagine that you have... I mean, if it's unclear, let me know. I think this is actually kind of clear. Here is the second version of the thought experiment. Exp Imagine that you have strong evidence that a coin is biased towards turning up tails, although unbeknownst to you, the coin is fair. In this case, the objective intrinsic probability of the fair coin turning up tails is 0.5. But the reasonable thing to believe, given your evidence, is that the coin is likely to turn up tails upon flipping. It follows that schema RS is false. A belief being objectively probable is not a necessary condition for it to be reasonable. Turn now to the second one of our dilemma, which supposes that the relevant notion of probability that we need is not objective intrinsic but conditional epistemic probability. The problem with working with this notion of probability, however, should already be evident given our prior discussion. We have no good reason to believe that this sort of probability is merely descriptive, since when a proposition since when a proposition enjoys this type of probability, this is not agent independent fact of the world but is relevant to an agent's evidence. The problem note is not simply that it is a matter of some debate whether the concept of evidence is normative. It is also that when we look at various proposals for understanding the notion of conditional epistemic probability, their normative dimensions are fairly apparent. To see the point, consider a broadly Readian view according to which the conditional epistemic probability of a proposition is determined by that degree of credence that an agent with properly functioning cognitive factors in a congenially mini environment who has no defeaters would have with respect to it. This is, for several reasons, clearly a normative analysis of conditional epistemic probability, implying that, if schema RS is correct, we analyze reasonability in terms of what Platinga calls warrant, and the normative notion of being and the normative notion of being a defeater. Plantinga, however, understands warrant in terms of the proper function of our cognitive faculties. How a cognitive faculty functions properly, Plantinga claims, when it functions as it ought to, where the relevant sense of proper is not a statistical but a normative one. Or suppose, somewhat differently, that we accept broadly Bayesian account of conditional epistemic probability. In this case, we would assign a probability to some phenomenon on a hypothesis. How probable the phenomenon is is on this hypothesis will, however, be a function of its prior probability, which roughly will be a matter of the evidence we have for our hypothesis independent of the phenomenon. Which evidence? Well, as we saw earlier, not all of it. Moreover, we cannot simply pick and choose which evidence, arbitrarily fixing some evidence to the conclusion of other evidence. At least we cannot if the notion of probability is play it probability in play is not a subjective but an objective one, as Heathwood claims. Rather, to determine a proposition's pro prior probability, we need to take into account the relevant evidence for the proposition, which is not a matter of appealing to evidence that you, you have or might have, but what you ought to have or take into consideriza consideration. Of course, the details of this approach can be developed in different ways. The point is that this general approach, which appeals to the notion of prior probability, is by all appearances also normatively laden. Yeah, so basically, this is the revenge. You're getting the same problems you had before. Either you're... As just said, you basically, you have to cherry pick what you're talking about, and cherry picking is not what you want, and that's like a normative thing. You're choosing what um, evidence you're looking at to make your uh, decisions, and therefore, even in epistemology, it's not going to work, because there's still a, you have to pick and choose which evidence matters. And the one above it, what was that real quick? Again, losing my mind. Oh, yeah. And then, like, if you think something is object, if the probability is out in the world, then you don't know it. You have no access to it. So, you don't actually, you can't do that. <coughs> so, it's like, is this something you don't have access to? Is the, uh, you're talking about, like, different things here. Again, it's like, well, who, if you pick, if you pick and choose, like, stuff, but, like, then you can... Again, if you pick if you pick and choose stuff, it doesn't matter. But like that's out in the world, and you have to say, well, which stuff did you pick and choose? 
Okay. <sighs> Our contention, in sum, is that we cannot understand the notion of being reasonable in terms of the concept of objective intrinsic probability, but neither does it look like look any more promising to understand in terms of the notion of conditional epistemic probability. In pressing these points, we wish to re-emphasize that our conclusion is supposed to be modest. We are not claiming that the notion of probability that Heathwood needs in order to analyze the concept of being reasonable <coughs> is normative. Rather, we are arguing that we have been offered insufficient reason to hold that the relevant notion is merely descriptive, pointing out along the way that the understanding Conditional epistemic probability in normative terms appears to be the dominant view. Philosophers such as Ian Hacking, read Ian Hacking if you want to read about uh, probability, have argued that there is reason to understand conditional epistemic probability in normative terms is the dominant view. For in the paradigm case, ascribing one or another probability to a proposition is supposed to guide our beliefs in, in the sense of giving us good reason to accept them. If such ascriptions did not have this role, then it would be very difficult to see why we should care more about them rather than other merely descriptive features that propositions might have, such as they're having truth values that are temporarily invariant, temporally invariant, or they're being composed of concepts. At any rate, our overall conclusion is that a satisfactory defense of epistemic descriptivism of the sort Heathwood endorses would require a defense of the claim that the notion of probability needed to reductively analyze epistemic notions is merely descriptive. That defense, however, has not been forthcoming. <sighs> Getting to the end. Six, prospects for a reduction. Is there any, is there an asymmetry between the moral and the epistemic domains? One according to which we have good reason to believe that while epistemic concepts and facts are descriptive, moral concepts and facts are not. In his essay, Heathwood maintains that there is such an asymmetry. Defending the disparity thesis, we've argued that there appears to be no such asymmetry. Defending, that the, defending the claim that, in this point, non-reductive realists do not face the difficult choice of having to choose between accepting either core, the core argument or the open question argument. Given that we focused on Heathwood's case for epistemic descriptivism, it would be hasty to draw any general conclusions about the prospects for epistemic descriptivism as such. Still, as we noted at the outset of our discussion, an increasing number of philosophers have found embracing epistemic descriptivism to be the most promising response to, core, to the core argument. However, if Heathwood's attempt to defend the position is illustrative, excuse me, it turns out to be exceedingly difficult to offer plausible descriptive analyses of epistemic concepts. There is, among other things, no easy generalization to make from the success of a reductive analysis of one epistemic com concept to the claim that the epistemic descriptivism as such is true. If so, we suspect that epistemic descriptivism will have to be developed along different lines, lines that do not require us to offer satisfactory reductive analyses of epistemic concepts. Like Heathwood, other defenders of epistemic descriptivism have not been sympathetic with moral descriptivism. The challenge for many of these views will be to explain why, if reductive analyses of epistemic concepts are not required to be a descriptivist about, about the epistemic domain, we should be descriptivists in the epistemic domain, but not in the moral domain. Whew. Okay. Okay. So, this took two hours, or almost two hours. Uh, I've been streaming for two hours now, but like, wow, this was um, a big mouthful, and I really liked the argumentation. I don't usually get to say that um, for most of the papers. The argumentation here was, um, for the most part, very, very solid. I have, you know, in some sense, a stylistic arguments with this paper. I don't like some of the arguments that they they um, used. And it's, I don't like the arguments they used because they were, I found, a little plotting. Like uh, this sort of going over all the examples and showing that. But in some sense, you have to sometimes, you know, if you want the juice, you have to go through the squeeze. And that's what they were doing here. So, yeah. Anyone have any questions, let me know. But yeah, this is uh, forthcoming in a meta-epistemology. Mm -hmm. So it looks like what they did was just, this was 
like as well argued, I think there was maybe some editing that should have been done in the middle of the paper. Um, and yeah, like pick and choose how you argue against stuff because there's always more than one way to do it. But yeah, I actually have almost no complaint, which is with uh, any of the arguments given here. Um, I had minor gripes, but like I can't even think at this point. Yeah, any questions from the uh, chat? This is busy earlier, but I think we lost some people recently. Okay, so let's see. Anything last... Oh, I couldn't mark up this paper. So I, I can't, can't even, like, grab things out. That's unfortunate. I should have worked on that earlier. Yeah, so... Basically... What happened was... Eh, short recap. is The argument was that, look... Epistemology and morality are different. Yeah, dude, I'm sorry, Cinecentemiotics. I will, like, collapse. Like, I'm not even kidding. Um, how about tomorrow? I mean, if you're around tomorrow, I can probably do it tomorrow. So. Um. Yeah. My apologies on th that. I can't... I don't want to push myself at this point. Um. <laughs> like, I, I really need to do longer streams, I think, because you get people in and out, and that's more fun. But, um... Yeah. Uh, health actually is uh, in question today. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's see. <sighs> yeah, so basically, it's asking the question if um, saying morality is different from epistemology. And the issue was, the Heathwood, which is the punching bag here. <laughs> I'm not drinking it. I have a stomach problem. I'm, I ain't putting nothing, like, I, I'm eating real simple foods. And I'm not putting any liquor in there. Believe me, I'd like to, but I'm not, I'm not testing it yet. Maybe next week. I mean, maybe a few days, but not yet. I haven't even heard back from my doctors. Like, I'm, I'm literally waiting to hear the medical reports still. Although I'm getting better, so. Uh, yeah. yeah, and the, the Heathwood basically said, look, they're different. And the authors said, we're not even arguing that there there is no difference. It's that all the reasons that were given that they're different were just really bad. And they were so bad that it's going to cause problems more generally. And I think that's kind of why they wrote the paper. Because uh, Heathwood wrote this in 2007, apparently. And so, whatever. I mean, it's 13, 14 years old now. Sure, good reason to criticize paper. But I'm sure it's been talked about before. But, like, you know, they've now they're making, like, a stronger claim about... This epistemic descriptivism, that epistemic descriptivism, which means that all epistemic claims about, like, things being, you know, justified are reducible to descriptive claims. So they're just describing something, you know, a descriptive fact about the world. And they were able to show, basically, that you can't argue for this stuff. And if you can't argue for this stuff, then the whole program of epistemic descriptivism also was falling apart because they were they were worried about the ethics stuff it looks like but then like they kind of were like well our criticisms if they work on the ethical side they work on the epistemic side so that's nice it was a it's a nice little shift when you find out that look you had you were like defending yourself but then also you made a wider point so that's good but, like, that's it for now. Um, yeah. Thank you, Cinesemiotics. Thank you. Have a good night. I'll hopefully see you tomorrow. Yeah, but if anyone else has any questions or whatever, suggestions, let me know now or else I'm going to go to bed. <laughs> Probably. I can't sleep. Thank you, Cryonics, for being here. Oh, yeah, thank you all for, for all the bits and all the uh, love earlier on. I appreciate that. We had a... Did we even have a hype train? I don't remember. We might have had a hype train. We, we had, like, a... Uh, we, 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 needed, we were really close to a hype train. Like, that was a little bit of fun. 
thank you. So thank you, Cryon- uh, Cryonics. Thank you, Valpo. Thank you, Cynosemiotics. Yeah, we'll find out, Valpo. I don't actually know when I'm going to be better. <laughs> Ain't nothing simple nowadays. Um. So yeah, have a good night all, and uh, yeah, go drink some scotch. Bye.